Truth Lover video podcast presented by Love and Truth Party. I am your host, Will Pye, author, speaker, transformational coach, workshop and retreat leader and founder of Love and Truth Party. You can find out more about me at willpie.com. Love and Truth Party is a self-organizing, self-replicating community and movement of love and awakening, a wisdom school facilitating health, healing and happiness liberating humanity from the matrix of fear and self-loathing. Find us and join our mailing list at www.loveandtruthparty.org. We exist to empower the deep realization and integration of unitive consciousness of one human being and to inspire action in the world from this clarity as New Earth Ninjas, our playful avatar. We do so in the spirit of play, holding the paradox that all is well, even and including all collective crises, while simultaneously being moved to act to lessen suffering and serve the creation of conscious culture and society. Our projects include distributing a million love letters from the universe, inviting people to receive the love and care in these and within the happiness acts, including the seven questions and other free resources, plus our online courses on meditation, gratitude, cancer, and depression, available soon on loveandtruthparty.com. O-R-G. We believe that in giving, we receive, and we invite you to pay forward the value you receive in this podcast by sharing, liking, subscribing for more great content, leaving a review on iTunes, getting your love letters from the website, following us on social media, and supporting us at loveandtruthparty.org. Today, I'm really delighted to be joined by a special guest, Rob Schwartz. Rob is a hypnotist who offers between lives soul regressions to help people heal and understand their life plan. In this form of hypnosis, you can discover what you planned before you were born, why you made those plans, how you're doing in terms of fulfilling your plan, and how you may better fulfill your plan. His first book, Your Soul's Plan, Discovering the Real Meaning of the Life You Planned Before You Were Born, explores the pre-birth planning of physical illness, having disabled children, deafness, blindness, drug addiction, alcoholism, the death of a loved one, and accidents. In addition to the subject of pets, his second book, Your Soul's Gift, The Healing Power of the Life You Planned Before You Were Born, explores the pre-birth planning of spiritual awakening, miscarriage, abortion, caregiving, abusive relationships, sexuality, adoption, poverty, mental illness, and other challenges. You can visit Rob online at www.yoursoulsplan.com or write to him at rob.schwartz at yoursoulplan.com. Rob, it's great to have you on the show. Welcome to The Truth Lover. Thank you, Will. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, We selected a a title, a way to start our our dialogue today. And uh, I think we landed on do we select our life challenges before we were born, which clearly is the central theme of your, 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 your two books. And I think it would be fair to say that our listeners, our viewers would have some idea of soul, would have some idea therefore of selecting life plans, but perhaps you can, Give us a little bit of flesh to that idea, the idea of uh, what, what are we talking about, a, a soul and, and choosing life plans? Well, let me explain first how I researched people's pre-birth plans for the two books, Your Soul's Plan and Your Soul's Gift. And by the way, if your audience goes to yoursoulsplan.com, uh, they can actually read large excerpts from the books for free. Uh, what I did to determine what people planned before they were born I collaborated with several very gifted mediums and channels who in one way or another could access that kind of information. Uh, One of them, for example, can hear the conversations we had with each other before we were born. So I was able to hear people talking to their future parents, future children, friends, enemies, employers, teachers, and so on. And I put those conversations verbatim into the books. Another one of the mediums can talk with the deceased Uh, Another one can channel a person's soul, a person's higher self. There's another who channels angels, some of whom serve as guides to people once they come into body. And in the new book, the second book, Your Soul's Gift, 
Uh, there are two new colleagues. One channel is an ascended master who uses the name Aaron, which was his name in his final incarnation on Earth. He has access to the Akashic Record. So that's how he finds out what somebody plans before they were born. And the other new colleague in your soul's gift is a channel in the Netherlands who channels Jesus. And that gave me the extraordinary opportunity to talk to Jesus directly and ask him what did somebody plan and why did they make those plans. So the methodology is that I interview somebody about a very common life challenge, and it's all the most common things we face here, the ones you listed, uh, because I wanted the books to help as many people as possible. And then that person has one, two, sometimes three sessions with the mediums in which we ask spirit, did this person plan this experience before birth, and if so, why? And then in the books, I present all the information that came through. Now, since the second book came out, uh, I became certified uh, to offer between life soul regressions. And that's the field of life between life regression that was pioneered by the American hypnotist Michael Newton back in the 1990s. He calls it an LBL or a life between life regression. I call it a between life soul regression, but it's the same thing. Uh, it's, as you said in the introduction, a form of hypnosis in which somebody can talk to spirit directly. So it's a direct experience. You're no longer relying on a medium to access information for you. And you speak with very highly evolved loving beings who know what your life plan is and can answer literally any question you ask about your life. So people come out of those sessions and they say things like, I have no more questions about my life. They answered every question I have. Uh, the other really notable thing about a between life soul regression, people talk to uh, what is known as the council of elders. Those are the, the beings who know what their life plan is. And the council consists of beings who are unconditionally loving and completely non-judgmental. So people will make comments like, uh, the sense that the council knew literally everything about me, including all the bad things I've done in my life. And yet I could feel that they loved me unconditionally. And, you know, for the average person, that's the first time they experienced that kind of unconditional love since they were back on the other side. So it's very much a homecoming in some ways. It reminds people of what life on the other side, which is our true home, is really like. And that can really renew somebody, restore their faith in the goodness of the universe, and inspire them to complete the plan that they created before they were born. I can imagine that's a joyful process to, to witness and facilitate. It's a very joyful process. You know, I, I actually used to be in the corporate sector. Uh, believe it or not, I have a master's in business, which I think is pretty unusual for somebody who's doing what I'm now doing. And that kind of work I found to be very, very unfulfilling. I did that for a long time and it brought me no joy at all. And that was really what led me to seek out the kind of work I do now. Uh, I just couldn't take it anymore. I had to do something that was actually meaningful that I felt was really contributing to the quality of people's lives. And I prayed about it, I meditated about it, I asked spirit for assistance. I asked God, what do you want me to do? Just tell me, cause me to know somehow, and I will be happy to do it. And that is exactly what happened. I, I was caused to know, so to speak, that this was my pre-birth plan. And once I knew that, uh, I was quite enthusiastic to embark on that path and also to leave behind the corporate world that I had been in for so long. How long ago was that? How long have you been walking this sort of more uh, authentic, true life path for you? This path started for me back in 2003. And what really kicked it off was a session that I had with a medium. It was the first session I ever had with a medium. You know, I come from a very conventional background. I wasn't even sure that I believed in mediumship, but I was so unhappy in this corporate work that I was doing. And I had already tried very conventional ways of figuring out some other path in life. You know, I did career counseling, talked to friends and family about what I should do. Nothing really shed any light on the matter. And so almost out of desperation, on May 7 of 2003, I had a session with the psychic medium. And I went into that session thinking, I'm not sure that this is a real phenomenon, but it's only an hour of my time. And if nothing comes out of it, there's no harm done. So I thought I'll give it a try. So I go into this session, the medium starts it off by asking me, do you know what a spirit guide is? 
Well, I had never even heard the term before. I said, no, what is that? She explained, well, it's a highly evolved being with whom you plan your life before you're born and who guides you through your life after you come into body. Then she starts to channel my guides. Now, coming as I did from a very conventional background, I probably would not have believed that any of this was real, except that as she was channeling the guides, it was very clear that they knew literally everything about me. So they said to me, you planned your life before you were born. And I, I just shook my head and I said, well, why in the world did I plan difficult experiences? And they said, well, you did that for purposes of spiritual growth. And then they went on to list all of my biggest challenges without me telling them anything about what those challenges had been. And they gave me very detailed explanations as to why I had wanted to have those difficult experiences. So this completely rocked my world. I, I came out of that session, uh, just expanded and opened in ways that I had never experienced before. I thought about this perspective constantly for days and days after the session. And the effect that it had on me was that it really created quite a deep healing because it allowed me to see the deeper meaning of my biggest challenges for the first time in my life. You know, previously, Will, I had thought of these challenges as meaningless suffering. And the fact that it struck me as meaningless made the suffering so much worse. But now with this explanation from my guides, I understood the deeper purpose of the difficult experiences I'd had. That created a profound healing for me. And then I realized, well, I'm onto a concept here that can bring a similar kind of healing to other people. And that was what really propelled me down that path. Yeah, the meaning and purpose that you speak to there was what really, in, in suffering in particular, was what resonated with your work and caused me to really be desiring of this dialogue. Um, certainly in my own life experience, that's been quite clear as a sort of in, intuitive knowing um, that the difficulties I was facing had function and, and purpose. And, and for, for me, it was about being able to help others. That was, that was the sort of primary meaning that I gave. And um, yeah, the, the perhaps most significant uh, event of, of my life, which m many of my uh, friends and followers would be aware of, was a, a diagnosis of a, of a brain tumor. And there was a, a sort of knowing at the time that this was perfection unfolding, that this was part of the plan. Um, though I didn't actually have at the time uh, a sort of conscious narrative or, or, or belief or, or, or knowing that I was a soul who had chosen a, a life plan. Um, but um, I, I think that the, the power of that transformation of being able to perceive our difficulties, our challenges, and, and know that there's meaning and purpose in them by way of our own evolution and, and, and growth is, 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 is really huge as a way of suffering the suffering less, perhaps. Um, what, what have you, what do you observe? You mentioned people being renewed and you've talked about your own um, sense of being expanded and, and, and so on. Can you tell us more about what happens when people take a different lens to perhaps maybe maybe some of the specifics, maybe have some examples. Let, let's say someone's been suffering from addiction or they've been um, suffering um, a mental illness or they've had a, a, a great challenge in relationship. And then they have this perspective come through that, in fact, this was part of the plan, that this was designed in some way to grow and evolve, what, what sort of effect does that have upon people? Well, it, it creates a, a very profound healing. Uh, it identifies in, in a very conscious manner what the underlying lessons are. And then once you know what the underlying lessons are, you can go about learning them uh, in a much less painful and a much less difficult way than would otherwise be the case. Uh, you know, I'll give you an example that comes to mind, a client I had just a few days ago 
uh, a woman, uh, 48 years old, American woman, who is divorced. She had one child, a son, who took his own life a couple of years ago. So she did a between life soul regression with me. Uh, we went through, uh, we start with a past life regression. So she went into a past life where she was with her son and found out some interesting things about their past life connections. And then uh, the client leaves the death scene in the past life. They leave the body in the death scene and cross back over to the other side, which I, I realize might sound a little bit ominous, but there's actually nothing to it. It's quite easy, natural, and gentle. And probably anybody listening to this interview has done it hundreds, if not thousands of times already. So when the client gets back over to the other side, generally they're met by one of their guides. Uh, so this woman was met by a guide. She talked to the guide briefly about why she was shown that particular past life. And then the guide took her to the Council of Elders. Now, one of the things that very often happens when people get to the council is that if there's some unresolved issue uh, with a loved one who has transitioned back to the other side, they will bring the loved one into the client's meeting with the council. So this happened for this woman. They brought in her son who had taken his life just a couple of years earlier. She and her son had this very loving, uh, profound, tearful reunion. Uh, they got to see each other again. They got to embrace etherically. She was able to tell him how much she loved him and missed him. He was able to say the same thing to her. And then she was able to talk with him about why he had taken his life. And the most healing aspect of that part of the conversation was that he was able to tell her in very clear terms, it had nothing to do with you. You did not fail me as my mother. You did nothing wrong. You were a great mother. It, it, this was issues of my own that I just wasn't able to resolve successfully. And she understood quite clearly that she was not responsible. Uh, but previously, of course, she'd been blaming herself. So by the time the session was over, she was almost a different person. And she said to me at the end of the session, after she came out of the trance state, for the first time in two years since my son took his life, I don't feel any emotional pain right now. I feel like all the pain is gone. So it was a profound healing for her. And that, that's the kind of thing that happens quite commonly in a between life soul regression. The turnaround there is quite phenomenal i mean in that example you've got someone if i'm feeling it correctly that would be in immense guilt and this new meaning allows perhaps even a sense of um contentment that they've actually contributed through going through that ordeal they've contributed to that individual that soul's um growth that that, that opportunity to to go through that experience um I'm intrigued if you can say more about suicide because that's a topic that is fascinating uh, to, 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 to fascinating to the mind, to the intellect, um, a cause of great pain for people that have experienced loved ones who've taken their own life. And within the context of a soul's plan, you, if, if our suffering is opportunity for evolution for growth um why would we volitionally leave the body why would we abort the mission as it were so there's an entire chapter in my second book your soul's gift about the pre-birth planning of suicide and the person i'm talking with in this chapter is an american woman named carolyn uh, her only child a son named cameron took his life right after he graduated from high school. Uh, he actually hung himself from a rafter in Carolyn's attic, and she was the one who found him. She came home, found his body hanging there, and she actually had to climb up on a ladder and cut the rope and take down her son's body. So tremendously tragic uh, and painful event. She and I worked with the uh, channel I mentioned earlier who channels Jesus. So toward the beginning of the channeling session, uh, Cameron, Carolyn's son, comes in and he assures her that he's fine. Uh, he assures her that it was not her fault. She had done nothing wrong. He talks about how when he was here in body, he was very depressed and very anxious. 
so much so that he was not able to feel his love for his family or his family's love for him. Uh, and he just couldn't find any solution to the depression and anxiety. And so he, the only option he saw for himself was a suicide. Then he steps aside and Jesus comes in. And I start off the conversation with Jesus by asking him, is suicide planned before we're born? And he says, it is never planned as a certainty, but it is planned as a possibility or sometimes a probability or rarely a probability so high as to be almost certain. And then he says, this was the case with Cameron. And he explains that Cameron was bringing back into body unhealed energies from past lives for the purpose of healing them. And he knew before he came into body that these unhealed energies would cause significant depression and anxiety. And so it was foreseen in his pre-birth planning session that a suicide was actually highly likely. Now you might ask, why would any soul undertake a plan like that? Well, some souls are very ambitious. They want to resolve a lot in a single lifetime. And this was the case with Cameron. He wanted to bring in all these unhealed energies from past lives and heal all of it in one lifetime. Also, our perspective is very different when we're back on the other side planning a life. One of the main differences is that you know that nobody is permanently harmed by anything that happens here. So you also know that a lifetime is very brief and that any learning, any wisdom that comes out of it becomes part of you for all eternity. You may or may not know any of those things when you're in body, but you know them quite clearly when you're planning a life. So from that perspective, that a lifetime is actually very brief. No one is permanently harmed by anything that happens here. And yet the wisdom becomes part of you literally for all eternity. From that perspective, it actually does make sense that some souls would choose to take on very great challenges, even if the likelihood of success was not all that high. So Cameron made that pre-birth choice. Now what's really interesting about the suicide chapter uh, and I will actually mention it's pages 410 to 411. Those two pages contain what I feel is perhaps the single most healing piece of information I've come across in all the years I've been looking at pre people's pre-birth plans. And what happened as I was writing the suicide chapter, you know, whenever I'm writing any portion of a book, I try to be very mindful of the information that comes across my desk because I know if there's something I'm supposed to be aware of so that I can put it in a book and make other people aware of it, Spirit will find a way to get the information to me. And this happened while I was working on the suicide chapter. I became aware of a, a wonderful book by an American author named Irene Kendig. It's called Conversations with Jerry and Other People I Thought Were Dead. And what Irene does in this book is that she works with the medium and has conversations with Jerry and other friends who are back on the other side, people that she thought were dead. So in one of her conversations with Jerry, the topic of suicide comes up. And Irene shares with her friend Jerry through the medium the following true story. It's a very simple story. There's a brother and a sister named Dan and Denise. They make plans to meet for dinner one night. And then shortly before they're going to meet for dinner, Dan calls, uh, I mean, Denise calls her brother Dan and cancels. Then during the time at which they would have been at dinner, her brother Dan suicided, he took his own life. So now Denise blames herself for Dan's death. She thinks if she just hadn't canceled their dinner plans, her brother Dan would still be alive. So Irene shares that story with her friend Jerry. Jerry responds by saying that if uh, Dan had had any openness or willingness at all to change his mind and not go through with the suicide, spirit would know and spirit would stage an intervention. So when I read that, the implication struck me like a lightning bolt. So I took that story into the channeling session with Jesus, shared it with him as I've just shared it with you now. And then I said to him, this story seems to imply that every suicide that could have been prevented was prevented. Is that true? Because if it is, it could heal all the guilt people feel at not preventing the suicide of a loved one. And Jesus responds, quote, every suicide preventable by outside forces was indeed prevented. I'll say it again. Every suicide preventable by outside forces was indeed prevented. 
So what that means is that if any of your audience has lost a loved one to suicide, there was literally nothing you could have done to prevent it. Because if the suicidal person had the slightest openness to change their mind, spirit would have known and spirit would have staged an intervention. So if anybody listening has lost a loved one to suicide, I would invite you now to take any guilt or self-blame you may feel and set it down and step away from it. Because again, there was literally nothing you could have done to prevent the suicide. So from a, a soul's perspective, suicide is one experience or way of bringing an experience to an end, not good nor bad, but uh, a sort of device within life experiences. Is that, is that fair to say from your observations? That is fair to say, and this is something that is hard to, to wrap a human mind around. But from the soul's perspective, nothing that happens on earth is judged as good or bad. All experiences are viewed as neutral and as learning opportunities, opportunities for evolution. So at the human level, we have all kinds of judgments about what is good, what is bad, what is right, what is wrong. The soul does not think like that. In fact, to say that the soul thinks is really a, a misstatement in its own right. The soul is, is basically operating on feeling. Feelings are the language of the soul. There's no judgment about suicide or anything that we do here. Uh, and if somebody does take their own life and they don't complete whatever it is that they planned before they were born, the soul does not judge the personality. The soul's attitude is simply, this is incomplete. There's a sense of incompletion. Let's try again and finish it, perhaps in the next lifetime. But no judgment at all. And I think a question that's coming through that I imagine would be present for many is, and in fact, a friend asked me this the other day, what's the overall point or purpose of all this? Is it uh, an eternal expansion into greater w wisdom? Yeah, because we're talking, of course, about the purpose of a particular life that may be around uh, healing particular energies or um actually let, let me ask a question there perhaps before we get into the the the, the meaning of life the um, purpose of a particular life would this include perhaps um to gain a particular insight and i'll just frame that question if i may when I work with individuals in, in, in workshops and so on, and, and, and sometimes coaching, we, we look at three, three questions as a way of reframing or transforming their experience of particular challenge or difficulty or suffering. And the questions are, what is the hidden gift here? What's the opportunity? And if I had somehow created this in order to learn a, uh, a pearl, a, a really powerful wisdom piece. What is that pearl? And I guess I'm interested to what extent that appears valid as an inquiry that we might create a particular difficulty in, in order to learn a specific, to, to embody, to have the experience of a specific value or, or insight or, or, or wisdom. So over a period of years, uh, as I researched many, many people's pre-birth plans, and in particular, uh, went into people's pre-birth planning sessions and heard the conversations that they had when they were planning their biggest challenges, one of the things I started to notice was that a lot of the conversation at the soul level revolved around a desire to cultivate and then express while embody certain qualities that are important to the soul. And I gave these qualities the name divine virtues. And over a period of time, I put together a list of the ones that came up the most often. I think there's now 28 on the list. It's things like compassion, unconditional love, empathy, patience, self-love, uh, and so on. The desire to cultivate and express one or more of the virtues is one of the main reasons we plan our biggest challenges. So when you talk about what is the gift, the gift would be the cultivation of one or more of the virtues. When you boil all of the virtues down, what you really get as a bottom line is that we are here to learn lessons in love. 
specifically how to give love and how to receive love. Both are equally important from the soul's vantage point. But that's really the bottom line as to what we're doing here on the earth plane. And challenges are often seen as giving both the motivation and the opportunity to cultivate the virtues and learn the lessons in love. I love that, the, the, the motivation and the opportunity that speaks really pertinently to my experience of the diagnosis. There was a sense on the one hand, there was the, the, the motivation to get on and uh, write the books and share what I'm here to share. Um, and the opportunity as well, there was a, a narrative now, there was a story blessed with a brain tumor that just sort of tripped off the tongue for me. And um, the function and purpose of that device, if you like, that, that, that experience of, of being reminded of one's mortality, and that this body comes to an end, was, was, was pretty clear. Um, that's fascinating, the 28 divine virtues. And I'm interested as well, there's a great resonance for me in hearing this, um, giving and receiving love. We often might be more inclined to give value to or emphasize the importance of, of being loving, of being kind, of, of giving love. And, um, often in my work with people and certainly it's been important in my journey learning to receive love uh, or we could say to release guilt or release self-loathing um, is a very important um, process or, em or embodiment uh, to actually re receive love as a, as an embodied experience you know not as a not as a narrative not as a mental story but actually to ex experience what it is to be loved and it's clear that in this uh, in, in these nervous systems in these bodies that's an experience that's available to us and my sense with the diagnosis was that this was an important resolution. Um, if, if I was going to stay in this body and uh, not die from the brain tumor, then to, uh, to, to, to be receiving love, to actually be in the embodiment where the, 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 the cells, including the cells in my brain, there's a, 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 an embodiment of love as being truly healing. And um, you know, so so far that um, <laughs> appears to be true in my experience, in that I'm still uh, a, a alive beyond a time frame that um, you know the, the cells that they found in my brain would would often indicate. Um, and I just appreciate that um, the, the the profundity of that that um, that this is something each of us potentially depending upon our journeys and our paths might be called to to open to and it's indeed it's part of the mission of love and truth party right these little love letters from the universe to invite people to take a moment to interrupt whatever patterns of thought or experience may be present and to actually receive the love of a friendly universe, uh, as we um, like to put it, and you know, Einstein framed it. And that feels to be, you know, going back to what you were saying, a, a frequent outcome, perhaps, of the, um, or, or an underlying meaning that would arise when people understand or have the experience of uh, that their life plan and that deeper purpose and meaning is a is a is a deep knowing of the friendliness of of life of 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 the universe that it's that it's ultimately a safe place in, including death well that's certainly one of the things i hope to accomplish with my work is for people to understand that 
when quote unquote bad things happen, it's not because we live in an unfriendly universe, it's because we live in a friendly universe and one in which we have free will and we used our free will to plan our challenges so that we could learn lessons in love. You know, the important thing I think for people to understand about giving and receiving love is that the flow of love in the world is circular in nature. Half the circle is giving love, half the circle is receiving love. So if you are somebody who does not allow others to give love to you, then you're blocking the flow of love in the world just as effectively as if you never give love to anybody else. And that's a really important thing for people to understand. You know, in my work, I've seen a number of cases now in which somebody had one or more uh, past lives in which they couldn't receive love from other people. And in response to that, they planned for the current lifetime to have a physical handicap, usually something that places them in a wheelchair so that they quite literally cannot run away from love in the current lifetime. It's that important. So that's a profound thought that an individual would choose an immobility in order that they're compelled to have a day-to-day -day experience of being cared for and looked after in a, in a very immediate and embodied way by another human being. I wonder if you can speak to the, uh, just circling back to that uh, greater purpose, the, 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 the overall meaning, you know, is it, is, is it uh, a linear process by which, you know, we, we complete the 28 divine virtues, uh, you know, to a degree of satisfaction and then um, move, move on to other realms? What, what's your sense of, the bigger picture and the overall meaning and purpose beyond the individual life and uh, in, into eternity as it were well the first thing i want to say in response to your question is that uh, you are not required or compelled in any way to master all 28 of the virtues first of all there's a lot more than 28 these are just the 28 that i've seen the most in my work but there are literally hundreds of virtues you could work on but even in regard to the 28, nobody is telling you you have to master these. You decide yourself, I would like to master compassion or I would like to deepen in patience, whatever it might be. And then what happens is you will have, I call it an arc of lives. It's a, a series of lives in which you work on cultivating or deepening in certain qualities. And once you get to the point where you feel satisfied with what you've done with that quality, then you go on to others. So hopefully what you see over the arc of lifetimes is progress in cultivating whatever qualities you're working on. Now, sometimes uh, people take a couple of steps back in a lifetime, uh, but you hope that the overall arc across that series of lives is one of progress. And generally that's, that's what I see. And what might a lifetime where the, the couple of steps back taken look like i'm sure we can all relate to that in a in our own lives that sometimes we we um we take a step back before taking a step forward what might that look like in a in, in a life that sounds like a, a life that would be considered um i think you use the word incomplete we might say a, a, a failure or, or not fulfilling the potential of that particular life well, very often we bring in, uh, as I mentioned before, energy, unhealed energies from past lives for the purpose of healing them. And sometimes we're not successful in doing that. Uh, for example, in my first book, Your Soul's Plan, there's an entire chapter about the pre-birth planning of what we call accidents, which I'm putting in quotes here because they aren't really accidents. So the story, one of the stories in that chapter is a woman who is blown up in a bomb explosion. And this is something that's part of her pre-birth planning. In her pre-birth planning session, she's talking with the soul who has the potential for planting the bomb. And this is a very troubled soul who has a lot of healing to do from past lives. And his hope is that he will be able to accomplish the healing in the current lifetime. 
But it's set up as a contingency. If he is not successful in accomplishing that healing, then he will plant the bomb. She will be exposed to the bomb. And then she will use the explosion to motivate her to go on to become a gifted healer. Well, that's the way it played out. This troubled soul was not able to accomplish any healing. He planted the bomb. This woman was blown up in the bomb explosion. But then she took it and used it to become a very gifted healer. So his life plan did not go exactly the way he wanted, but he'll have infinite opportunities to, to, to accomplish that healing. And she, on the other hand, did exactly what she wanted to do. She became a gifted healer in this lifetime and has changed many, many people's lives. And in that context, if we were to um, use some conventional languaging, the, the troubled soul um, committing an, an illegal act, certainly. Um, some would say an, an, an evil act, uh, an act that's intended to cause harm to others. Yet in this context, from this perspective, this bigger picture view, that evil is in fact contributing to expansion, to, 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 to growth in, in the bigger picture. You know, I, I asked Jesus in, in one of the discussions with him about the subject of evil, and I said to him, my understanding is that there really is no such thing as evil. There are just souls who are in a lot of pain, and they're acting out in ways uh, to express their pain, but they've lost sight of the divinity within themselves, the, the light within, but it's still there. They're just not aware of it. And he confirms uh, yes, this is uh, correct. There really is no such thing as evil. It's as you've said, there are just souls in pain who are enacting that pain uh, in ways that are hurtful to others. But those souls who are committing those acts, they are divine beings just as you and I and everybody who is going to hear this uh, conversation are divine beings. There, There is no being anywhere who is not sacred or holy in nature, who is not a part of God but there are beings who are in a lot of pain. And that pain clearly can, and this might be a troubling perspective for some, that pain can be carried from lifetime to lifetime. So how does one, what are the general means or methods by which one processes or transmutes trauma or pain in a lifetime and perhaps you can relate that to the processing of collective trauma you know right now upon the planet it seems that uh it's true that we're facing a lot of darkness facing a lot of um a lot of traumatic experiences and there's a sort of collective reckoning it feels I wonder if you can speak to the, the, the how we would resolve trauma or pain in a lifetime, what that might look like, and, and, and whether there is such a thing of taking on collective um, pain and, and, and transmuting that through an individual life. Well, I'll come back to the uh, bomb explosion story in your soul's plan. Uh, the woman who experienced uh, the bomb explosion, her name is Christina. And this happened when she was in her early 20s. She's now in her 60s. But when she was in her early 20s, she was employed as an administrative assistant at a college in California. And uh, one of her daily duties in that job was to pick up her boss's mail. Well, the mailboxes were located in the basement of the building in which she worked. So she went one day down those stairs to the basement mailboxes, just as she had done dozens of times before. But on this day, unbeknownst to her, uh, a pipe bomb had been planted in her boss's mailbox. When she inserted her hand to pick up the mail, the bomb detonated. The explosion threw her against a concrete wall. Flames scorched her body from head to toe. She lost a couple of fingers, both eardrums were ruptured. Uh, when she got to the hospital, doctors actually had to hold magnets over her eyes to extract the shrapnel from the pipe. So here we have a level of suffering that is almost unimaginable to the average person. And as you can quite easily understand, 
she was very, very angry of and judgmental of the person who planted the bomb. So how did she heal? Well, her recovery from the bomb explosion took about two years and 10 reconstructive surgeries. At one point during that two year period, she was lying in her hospital bed in a lot of pain when she suddenly heard a voice inside her head, a voice that was not her own. It turns out that the bomb explosion, in addition to damaging her body, had opened up her psychic gifts. She had become clairaudient. And the voice she heard talking to her that day in the hospital was one of her guides. The guide said to her, you planned this. And of course she said, why? And then the guide told her and he said, you wanted before you were born to have a lifetime as a gifted healer. And you knew that if you could heal yourself from the effects of this bomb explosion, you would then be able to take all of that wisdom and knowledge about healing and turn it outward in service to others. Well, that's exactly what she went on to do. After the 10 surgeries were over, she went back to school. She got a PhD in speech language pathology and set up a private clinical practice working as a healer. At this point in her life, she's healed literally thousands of people. But over the years, she took that understanding of her pre-birth plan that her guide gave her that day and used it to pull herself out of victim consciousness. You know, victim consciousness, as I understand it, is literally the lowest vibration a human being can be at. And it tends to be self-perpetuating because when you believe that you're a victim, you vibrate at the frequency of victim. When you vibrate at the frequency of victim, you're stating energetically to the universe that you are a victim. Well, whatever energetic statement you make to the universe, the universe always responds in exactly the same way. It always responds by saying, yes, that's right, you are. So if you state energetically to the universe that you're a victim, it says, yes, you are, and it brings you more experiences that seem on the surface to confirm that you're a victim. The way to break out of that negative self-perpetuating cycle is to come into the understanding, as Christina did, that you are the powerful soul who planned the explosion or whatever the challenge might be. So Christina really worked with her understanding of her pre-birth plan over a period of years to get herself to a place of forgiveness. She pulled herself out of victim consciousness. She saw the deeper spiritual meaning and purpose of it, and she forgave the person who planted that bomb. When I interviewed her for Your Soul's Plan, she said to me, I have completely forgiven the person who planted the bomb. Now remember, she had magnets held above her eyeballs in the hospital. And yet here she is saying with complete sincerity that she has completely forgiven the person who inflicted that kind of suffering on her. But you know, then she said something even more remarkable. She said, Rob, I am deeply grateful to the person who planted that bomb. And when she says she's deeply grateful, she really and truly means it. So here is somebody who took an awareness of her pre-birth plan, used it to pull herself out of victim consciousness and get eventually to a place of total forgiveness and total gratitude. Now, her story is unusual in that it's a bomb explosion, but she herself is not unusual. If she can do this after what she went through, then you and I and anybody listening to this conversation can do it in regard to our challenges. We can all use an understanding of our pre-birth plan to get to that place of forgiveness and get to that place of gratitude. In terms of how you heal collective trauma or collective pain, it's essentially the same process, but it's done on a much larger scale. So an entire country, for example, the majority of the people who constitute that country have to come into some kind of understanding that enables them to get to a place of forgiveness and ideally to a place of gratitude. That can take a lot of years, but we've seen it happen. If you think back to who was enemies with whom at the time of World War II, those countries are now, for the most part, friends with each other. So it can be done. And one way to do it is by understanding the pre-birth plan. So if I'm hearing that correctly, a country or a, a collective of people might go through an experience collectively in order to shift the what it is to be German or what it is to be American or whatever it is. And 
is that 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 sounds quite different from i think how people at least as i understand it often speak about healing collective trauma which would be the idea that i might take on this body might take on particular pain or challenge in in order as a way of uh, purifying or um transmuting those particular energies such that others have to suffer less it's a bit of a martyr story it's a bit of a christ uh, narrative in that do you have a sense of that being valid or perhaps a, a, a misperception of how this uh, how, how these lives work no I, I i my understanding is that that is valid and it does happen just as you've described uh you know the focus of my research is primarily individual challenges not collective or national challenges or karma uh, but i've seen what you just described on an individual level for example uh, early on when i was doing the research for my first book one of the stories i looked at which didn't eventually end up in the book was somebody who had taken on the karma of a murderer this was a, a very highly evolved very high vibrational soul who chose quite consciously to assume the karma of somebody who had committed a murder because he knew that he had the ability to transmute this karma and so he was doing it in service to the murderer uh, and it resulted in quite a bit of suffering for him but he was in fact able to do it so it, it's quite a beautiful gift to give to another soul if one is capable of doing it i want to feel to draw back to something you touched on a few moments ago and that's the shift from uh, victim consciousness to we could say creator consciousness and it actually drew to mind a, a line in uh, blessed with a, a brain gym in my first book where I think I say something like we're so powerful that we can even choose to have the experience of being disempowered of sort of abdicating our creatorship and experiencing what it is to apparently be powerless to be in victim consciousness and I see it often in people that I know in teaching roles and in powerful healing roles that they'll sometimes speak of this, that they've sort of returned back to or got back into the pattern of or, or, or a thought pattern of, of, of victimhood. Um, and this seems to be something quite significant around our purpose or our reason for being here if we're coming from a place of creatorship then i can choose what i'm going to create rather than listen to what someone else might tell me is my life purpose or uh, my reason for being here but rather i can choose the most um beautiful desirable um purpose or or, or or creation yet that seems to be slightly at odds with the specific plan or purpose that i have decided upon before embarking into this into this life so i wonder if you can speak to that is there is it the case that that i have um or anyone has truly infinite possibilities to choose from paths to walk or rather is it that this life would include discovering um the 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 the, the potential that i'm here to fulfill i think you you have an infinite number of choices of experiences before you come into body before you actually have a life plan but once you have a plan, once you come into body, then there's a framework, there's a structure that's in place uh, in which you have a lot of leeway, you have a lot of free will decisions to make, but there are certain parameters in place that you can no longer go past. For example, your choice of parents. 
Obviously, once you're born, then that's fixed. You can no longer change your choice of parents. Or if you choose before you're born, for example, to have a physical handicap that can't be treated by medical science in whatever time period you're incarnating, and you would know that before coming into body, then short of what we call a miracle, you will have that physical handicap for the duration of that lifetime. But most things are planned as possibilities or probabilities. They're not planned as certainties like the couple of examples I just gave. Uh, and one of the main reasons we plan challenges is to experience contrast. So you, you talked about how we're infinitely powerful, so much so that we can plan to experience being powerless. What I have seen in my work is that that is what a lot of life plans are actually based on. Uh, not the ex specific experience of powerlessness, but rather choosing some form of limitation which you hope before you're born that you will move beyond in the course of a lifetime. So that within one lifetime, you have the contrast between the limitation, whatever it might be, and then the experience of moving beyond it. That experience within one lifetime gives you as a soul a tremendous knowing of your inherent power, your inherent limitlessness. Uh, for example, the, this whole idea comes up in the conversation with God books, which I'm sure you've heard of. And uh, God asks Neil Donald Walsh, the author of those books, to explain it using the analogy of the white room, which goes like this. Imagine that you are a white being in a white room. So you are white, the ceiling is white, the floor is white, all the walls around you are white, everything in this room is white, including you. Now, if you are such a being in such a room, how do you know that you're white? Well, the answer is you don't. And in fact, you can't until you experience something that is other than white. Then once you've had that experience, you understand much more profoundly what it means to be a white being in a white room. This, I think, is what the soul is doing here on the physical plane. We are infinitely powerful, but because that's the only experience we're having on the other side, we don't fully understand what it means to be infinitely powerful. And so we come here to this place of limitation where we can experience who we are not, where we can experience the contrast. And by having the experience of the contrast, by the time we go home at the end of a physical incarnation, then we understand much more deeply what it means to be an infinitely powerful being. Does that make sense? It does, and I think that both uh, intellectually and in an embodied sense, it's easy to grasp that um, in order to know joy, for example, um, it helps to have first known what is not joy. And indeed, um, in, in my experience, and I think there are many teachings that point to the being a proportionality. So the further we go into uh, despair or darkness, the greater the, the flip side, as it were, in terms of our capacity within the nervous system, within the, the, the range of contrast to experience delight and, and joy and so on. I think there's a beautiful Khalil Gibran quote along these lines where he says that, I'll probably butcher the quote, so I apologize, Khalil, but it was something like, we, in our burrowing of despair, make the same grooves through which we'll come to know joy. and. Certainly that seems to be true. And in my experience, it seems that um, hopelessness and, and, and hope are given meaning via each other through a relationship with each other. Um, and of course, the, one of the ultimate contrasts or, or, or um, dualities or opposites or complementary complementarities is is, is, is good and evil, um, or love and fear. And what I'm hearing and feeling from this sort of big picture that we're taking is a, is a kind of a collapsing of those dualities, much as in the yin yang symbol, we come to see that in fact, they're complementary, interrelated, and each is in the other. 
Yeah, I think very much, very much. In my books, I refer to this as a learning through opposites life plan. And the average person is learning through opposites in an incarnation. It's a very powerful and a very effective way to learn whatever it is you want to learn. And there are an almost infinite number of pairs of opposites that you can choose to learn from on the earth plane. It's also a very difficult way to learn, uh, but it's very effective. And I think the reason it's effective is that the pain we experience here in the earth school often has the effect, uh, hopefully, of breaking one's heart open. And the breaking open is itself painful. But then once the heart is open, then you have an enhanced ability to give and receive love, which as we talked about earlier, is the bottom line purpose for being here. So if you are a soul who feels you learn best by having your heart broken open through challenge, you would choose to come to earth because that frankly is what happens here. I don't think there's too many people listening who would disagree that that's uh, frankly what happens here. And it brings to mind a teacher of mine, Jumpo Dennis Kelly Roshi, who uh, his um, uh, autobiography is called uh, Heart Blown Open. And he very much speaks of this um, function and experience of the, the heart being blown open. And that can take some intensity, it can take some pain, it can take some difficulty um, in, order to, in order to have that experience. Well, what a wonderful way to, to, to start my day here in Australia, Rob, to be in this uh, conversation. I found it fascinating. I'm looking forward to finding out more about your work. And I'm sure many of our viewers and listeners will be uh, getting onto your website and, and getting in contact as well. Um, I really want to thank you for taking the life path that you have for, for listening to that call for um i imagine uh, feeling the dissatisfaction and the discontent of uh, your prior existence and heeding the call to um step into quite a quite a different world and and, and, and path uh, quite 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 the contrast there i said yeah but a much much uh, more fulfilling life and I, i'm glad that i i made the change and I want to thank you for having me on and, and thank you more generally for having the podcast in the first place. I think it's a, a beautiful form of service for a world very much needed. And I'm glad that uh, you are embracing your pre-birth plan and doing what you came here to do. Thank you, Rob. I appreciate that reflection and uh, it's been a, a, a joy to connect with you. So thank you and uh, I wish you wonderfully well. Thank you, you too. And thank you to our viewers and everyone that's shared in this experience with Rob and I. Um, you can visit loveandtruthparty.org to join our community, um, check out other extraordinary human beings and teachers such as Rob who have appeared on the podcast. You can also download all the love letters, register for our newsletter, uh, connect on social media, and consider a financial gift to support loveandtruthparty.org. Thank you to all our supporters and contributors. Together we are creating kind, conscious, courageous human community.